pleasure to get to, uh, to talk with you today and to do this class session. I know this topic of enzymes in food analysis is one of Pam's favorite topics too. So I'm glad she was willing to, uh, to share that. As she said, she was a postdoc in, um, in my lab some years ago. And this was the enzymes and proteins is what we did in my, in my lab. Um, what I'm sure Pam hasn't told you, uh, um, she's too modest to do that, but she and I jointly will do the next edition of the food analysis textbook, the sixth edition, which we'll target for about three and a half years from now. And, um, and then after that, it's all hers. Um, I'm stepping out. Five editions on my own was enough. And, um, you know, I got talked into doing this very early in my career, uh, but I needed a food analysis book, I, you know, to teach it. There just wasn't one. And that's how I got talked into it. Um, but it's worked as a, as a joint effort. And I've, I've used Pam in the last couple of editions to help figure out the, the content and the organization. So, so you can blame her a little bit for things, but but you'll be able to blame her completely in future editions of the, of the book. So, okay, so Pam, I'm going to... Um, oh, I need to give you, uh, I think I didn't make you a co-host, but now, now you can, you're supposed to can share now. Yeah, let's try that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, can you see now, Pam? No, you need to click on. Uh, oh, it was the wrong one. The, yeah, yeah. Share. I clicked on the wrong. I think I clicked on the wrong one. Okay, now we can see. See it. Okay. All right. Great. Um, all right, but it's not on sh on a slideshow. So let me do that. Okay, can you see the full screen now? Yeah, I right. we can see it now. Good. Well, again, it's a pleasure to get to talk with you about this on this topic. I'm, I know that you've already covered um, enzymes to some extent, certainly in a food chemistry class and probably a biochemistry class, but um, uh, so we won't go to it in, in great detail here, but enough to focus on it from a standpoint of doing using enzymes in analysis. Um, to do that, let's start with the center diagram that you have here. You'll see the enzyme sucrase reacting with the substrate sucrose um, to form this enzyme substrate complex, right? Um, and then we go along and we um, separate the substrate and the, and the enzyme. We generate the products, glucose and fructose, and, um, and then again, regenerate the enzyme, okay? So that's one, that's an example of, of, of an enzyme assay, an enzyme uh, reaction. And it relates to one of the four pictures that are around, that are shown around here. So I'm gonna see if I can expand this so I can see more of you, hang on. Um, so I'm gonna ask you uh, for a show of hands here. Um, so this center picture um, goes along with one of the four um, items around this. We'll call number one will be the corn. Number two is the orange juice. Number three is the is the flour bag of flour, and number four is the um, chocolate covered cherry. So this diagram in the center, which one does it relate to? How many think by a show of hands? How many would say it's number one, the corn? Anybody? What about number two, the orange juice? Number three, the bag of flour? And number four, the chocolate covered cherry? Yes, that's it, that's it, the chocolate covered cherry. Um, so, you know, when they make chocolate covered cherries, they coat the cherry with a crystalline sucrose solution with a little bit of invertase present. Um, dip it in chocolate then and um, put it in the box. And by the time you purchase that box of chocolate covered cherries, the, um, the crystalline sucrose has broken down to a liquid form 
of sugar being glucose and fructose, right? So, um, so there's an example of, of, um, of an enzyme being used as a, as a processing aid, actually. Um, now, there's three other examples that are given here. We'll go through those briefly. And, um, and then on the next slide, I'm gonna ask you for, if you can identify another example of an enzyme either used in food processing or to determine the quality of a product or in an assay. But let's look at these three examples. The corn is meant to represent, um, remind us about high fructose corn syrup. You know, the starch from corn is, um, is used and hydrolyzed with the enzyme amylase, right? And then, um, and then break it down to glucose, reacted with another enzyme, uh, glucose isomerase, which converts the glucose to fructose. So we end up with a combination of glucose and fructose, that's high fructose corn syrup. And you pay for the high fructose corn syrup actually based on the fructose content. Um, all right, this, the, the orange juice one reminds us about the enzyme pectin methylesterase, um, which, uh, you know, if you were to uh, squeeze a, an orange and um, leave the juice sitting out on your, in a glass on your, on your counter for a while, it will start to settle out. The pectin methylesterase is, um, is destabilizing the pectin and we get this, uh, this uh, phenomenon called uh, cloud loss, okay? So it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It just looks a little bit um, unpleasant, all right? And the last one, the bag of flour is meant to remind us about the enzyme amylase. Amylase is, um, is produced if the wheat kernel starts to get kind of warm and, and, um, and moist uh, after harvest, it thinks it's supposed to start germinating. So it starts produ producing enzymes that will break down the components of, um, of the kernel. And that's how we can end up with some amylase in the, the flour. Now you can imagine if that flour was gonna be used to make a starch paste or to thicken something, we would get less of that thickening if we have high levels of amylase present, right? Okay, so um, let's go on to the second slide, which is a uh, blank on your version. And we're gonna fill this in. Let me ask you to write in the chat box, another example, if you can think of one, of an enzyme either used in food processing or used as a, used as a quality indicator or used um, in a, to, to do an assay. Um, I'm gonna ask you to write that in the chat box. Just a few words, you don't have to write a big paragraph or anything, just a few words. Pam's gonna be monitoring the chat box and, um, and we're, gonna, we're gonna kind of fill in those, some of those blanks uh, with some categories. So, um, let me give you just a minute to write in, if you can think of another example besides the ones we just talked about of enzymes used. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm already getting, getting some good ones. Okay. So we're getting uh, lactase for, uh, to produce lactose-free milk. Ah, okay. We're getting a papain, a bromelain for meat processing. Great. Uh, we're getting the polyphenol oxidase mm. or enzymatic browning. Mm -hmm. Invertase was one. So there's rennet in cheese. Mm -hmm. And then the pectinase for juices. Transglutaminase okay. for gluten-free bread. Yeah. All of good, good, good examples. examples. Well, you can see that, that some of those will fit into these categories. Let me start with the waste management one, which is probably one that you might you might not have thought about, but you probably are familiar with the fact that um, the wastewater that comes from a food processing facility, if it has organic matter in it, that we need to try to break down that organic matter. Either the, the food processor will, or when it goes to a waste processing facility, it's gonna have to get 
that organic matter needs to get broken down or we end up with lots of problems when, the, when that water gets dumped into a stream. That's the topic of um, chapter 28 in the book is on, on oxygen demand. Uh, so of course, what will break down organic matter? Um, enzymes, right? Either adding enzymes directly to the water or adding microorganisms that produce enzymes, right? So that's one way to do it. The processing tools, it sounds like we had a, several examples of processing tools, right? Rennet and I don't remember some of the other ones that you identified, Pam. So papain for um, meat, meat processing, lactase for lactose free milk. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And then for food quality, did we come up with any examples relevant to food quality? Polyphenol oxidase uh -huh. is one. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing other one for quality. Okay. Here. So does anybody know, uh, have you ever heard of the enzyme alkaline phosphatase? Anybody, anybody taken a dairy class yet? Right? And, or, you know, or maybe processing. <laughs> processing, maybe processing, where we need to pasteurize the milk, right? Um, and the whole intent is to kill um, harmful bacteria, pathogens. But it would take days to test for those pathogens. So instead, what's commonly done is this test for alkaline phosphatase. That enzyme, the words for that are going to show up on one of the last slides. So you don't need to worry about writing it down now. But alkaline phosphatase is used um, because it's naturally present in milk. It's very heat stable. So if you can inactivate the, pecti the, the alkaline phosphatase, you're sure you've also inactivated the pathogens in the milk, right? Um, another one that would relate to food quality would be um, peroxidase. Peroxidase is often used as an indicator of adequacy of blanching of vegetables you know, before freezing vegetables, okay? Um, Measuring activity. Were there any examples relevant to that, Pam? Yes, I was on mute. Yes, yeah, so somebody said for measuring carbohydrate content, enzymes for carbohydrate content. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one, one student said polonase, which is one of them, but oh. yeah. Okay, okay. Um, you know, yes, there are examples uh, like this issue of the amylase. Sometimes we need to measure that, that enzyme activity. Um, let's go on to the quantification of food constituents. And I think I heard what you said, Pam, to quantitate carbohydrates, you know, to quantitate starch and to quantitate glucose. You've already covered those, I understand, from the carbohydrate analysis chapter. Um, using uh, amylases to break down the starch and then glucose oxidase peroxidase um, to react with the glucose, right? Um, anything on sample preparation, Pam? Uh, no, actually. Okay, so do you remember what you covered in the carbohydrate analysis chapter to do fiber analysis? Anybody remember an enzyme that was used in fiber analysis? So we're not getting anything yet. Okay, but all right. If you remember, we have to get rid of, uh, well, no, you don't want to break the cellulose, but thank you, Coleman. It is not cellulase that you want to get. You want to break up other components to get them out of the system. What mm -hmm. other components you don't want? So you only want the dietary fiber. So what do we hydrolyze and try to get rid of? Proteins. Protease, yes. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sam and Jean. Uh -huh. Right. And then what the else? other thing, of course, is the starch. We don't want to count starch uh, as dietary fiber unless it's truly resistant starch. So we use amylases to break down the starch to, to glucose so it can be easily um, solubilized and washed away. Okay. And the last... Um, at the bottom of the slide that we're going to add here is isolation and characterization. You know, that was the kind of thing that, that uh, graduate students and postdocs worked on in my lab when I had a research program was, was a lot on um, isolation and characterization of, of proteins. It's probably more of a research or of enzymes. 
And of course, they had to understand enzyme kinetics a bit to be able to, to work in that area. We also really have to understand a bit about enzyme kinetics to, to do any of these other assays that uh, we talked about, either measuring enzyme activity or um, measuring um, their, how much to, yes, to add to something. How much rennet do we need to add to a big vat of milk? We need to measure enzyme activity. So we need to understand something about the kinetics. We're gonna spend a little time on that now. So at the bottom of the slide, you see the same figure that we just talked about. And you'll recall, we saw that we've got an enzyme, in this case, it was sucrase, um, with the substrate uh, sucrose. Uh, we form an enzyme substrate complex in the center, and then we regenerate the enzyme and produce the products, right? Um, so that's exactly what was happening in that diagram. You'll notice that each one of those reactions, there's a, there's a reaction rate constant that is associated with each one of those. And you'll notice that that initial reaction is a reversible reaction. Um, now, in red, you'll see that, uh, so with these enzyme assays, of course, we've got a minimum of these two events, the enzyme and the substrate um, stereochemically binding to form that tight enzyme substrate complex, and then a chemical conversion where the substrate is converted to the product. And then in the upper right-hand corner, we're reminded that enzymes are really biological catalysts, and they reduce the activation energy that's required for a chemical reaction to convert reactants to products. So you can see the activation energy for um, the enzyme assay as compared to um, a non-enzymatic reaction. It requires a much higher activation energy. Okay, let's go on to, uh, to this diagram. The same, the same figure that we just saw, the same e set of equations we just saw here. And now we're gonna look at this figure that shows the time course of an enzymatic reaction. So this would be an enzyme and a substrate reacting and following that over time. So on the x-axis, we have time. And on the y-axis is the product that's generated, right? Now, you see at the very beginning of that curve, it, that's called the pre-steady state. So that's when the enzyme and the substrate are, um, are being complexed. And it happens very quickly. You can see milliseconds, right? And then we have another portion of the curve um, that where we can, um, we can draw a line tangent to that. This is the linear portion of the curve. That's where we're especially interested in this linear portion of the curve. Um, but, uh, and the slope of that, that um, linear portion of the curve is called V naught. That's the initial velocity, right? We're gonna talk more about that initial velocity in, a, in just a minute now. All right. So here's that initial velocity, the same figure that we just saw over on the right. Um, the other two terms that relate to enzyme kinetics, and you can see at the top a reminder that we need to understand the enzyme kinetics to control the rate of enzyme catalyzed reactions. The other two terms that we need to be familiar with are maximum velocity, the Vmax, and the Km, Michaelis constant. I bet you talked about that probably back in a biochemistry class. Um, maximum velocity, you can see velocity uh, of the reaction at a very large substrate concentration. And Michaelis constant, you can see, is defined as the substrate concentration at half the Vmax, so half of the maximum velocity. So why is that term important? You'll see it's important because it's really characteristic about the binding of the enzyme and the substrate, right? The smaller that number is, the tighter the enzyme substrate binding is, okay? So these are all three terms that we need to um, be aware of and have some understanding of as we, um, with related to enzyme kinetics to be able to control the enzyme reactions. Um, now the next slide uses the same, has the same definitions for those three terms. 
um, but it shows a different diagram now. Now we have the rate of an enzymatic reaction as affected by substrate concentration, okay? So substrate concentration is on the x-axis. So what we're doing is reacting increasing amounts of substrate with our enzyme, and we have the velocity of the reaction on the y-axis. You can see that this is a, um, a hyperbola. It's, a, it's not a straight line, and you can see what Km really is. Remember we said this is the initial velocity on the y-axis. Maximum velocity is up here, and by definition, Michaeli's constant is the substrate concentration at half the maximum velocity. So here's maximum velocity, here's half maximum velocity, and this is the substrate concentration at half maximum velocity. What we're going to see in a minute, that's important because some reactions, we want the substrate concentration to be less than the Km. Some types of reactions, we want it to be the substrate concentration to be much greater than the Km value. Okay, um, now before we look further at that point, let's remind ourselves of the kinds of things that affect the Km and the Vmax. You know, when you do an enzymatic reaction, it's going to be at a particular temperature, at a particular pH, um, and you can see those are the kinds of things that affect the Km and the Vmax. So all the typical things that you need to control in an assay are, are affecting the Km and the Vmax. You'll see pH and temperature affect both of these. Um, you'll see in inhibitors can affect both of those. Uh, the nature of the substrate affects both of those. And you'll also see that enzyme concentration affects the Vmax, right? So, when you, um, when you do an assay, you need to control all of those things so you can control the kinetics of that, that reaction. Um, now, if you were to do this in, um, if you were to develop your own assay, you would have to determine the Km and the Vmax and determine all of those conditions you should be using. But when you buy a test kit, um, to do an enzyme assay. You can buy those from Sigma or other companies. They will have all of these things controlled for you. They tell you what pH, they tell you, they give you a buffer, they tell you exactly the conditions you should be using because they know you need to control all of those things so that you can control the Km and the Vmax. Okay, now, now we're going to take a look again at what do we want to, what kinds of reactions do we do less than the, at a substrate concentration less than the Km, and which ones are greater than the Km? Okay, so if what I want to measure is a substrate like starch or glucose or, um, let's think of another one, pectin or something, if I, if I want to measure a substrate then I need to use a substrate concentration much less than the Km value. So back on the, the left side on that x-axis. And that would be first order with regard to substrate. Okay. If instead what I want to measure is an enzyme, if I wanted to measure the amount of amylase or rennet or a pectin methylesterase, then I would need to use a substrate concentration much greater than the Km, up near the, the, the Vmax. And in that case, it's going to be zero order with regard to substrate, first order with regard to enzyme. Okay. Here's that same diagram we just saw, right? And that diagram is, um, is depicted by the, with the, the michaelis menten equation. Remember we said the, the Michaelis constant was that Km value? So this equation called the michaelis menten equation is really what describes this figure that we've been looking at, this hyperbola. But you know, we don't like to work with, um, with curved lines. We'd much rather work with a straight line, right? So we can convert this equation, this michaelis menten equation to an equation for a straight line. And that's what's done when we, uh, with the line Weaver-Burke plot. 
So look on the lower left-hand side. Here's that same diagram we just had with the michaelis menten equation. We can take the reciprocal of that equation. So instead of V, it's now going to be 1 over V. And everything's 1 over what's there. Look at the equation over on the right-hand side in the center. That's the line weaver burke equation. And this is called a line weaver burke plot. I'll bet you saw this back in a biochemistry class somewhere. Uh, it's been, maybe it's been a little while, but you probably saw that. And you can see that now, instead of, um, of um, substrate concentration on the x-axis, we have one over the substrate concentration, right? And we have an x-axis, uh, an x-intercept and a y-intercept, and we have a slope for this line. Um, what we're able to do is calculate the Km value if we have this slope and we can determine the, uh, the Vmax, okay? All right. So with that, I hope we've got some understanding of the kinds of things we need to control. Uh, these terms, the Km, the Vmax, and um, what kind of substrate concentrations do we need to have if well, we want to measure substrates versus if we want to measure enzymes. Now let's go on and talk about some of those conditions that we identified that affect the Km and the Vmax, right? Remember, enzyme concentration was one of those. Enzyme concentration, we said, affected the, the Vmax, right? Uh, so just as you'd expect, as we increase the enzyme concentration, we increase the velocity of the reaction. Just what you'd expect, right? Okay. But what enzyme concentration should we use? Well, um, this is a diagram that shows four possibilities. Concentration one, two, three, or four. These are increasing um, enzyme concentrations. You can see uh, plotted with time and the amount of product that we have generated. The dashed lines are the actual values that would be measured. And the solid lines are the tangent that are drawn um, next to this, the, um, the straight portion of that curve. Now let's say if I wanted to measure, um, do this assay and I wanted to stop it at time A, all right? If I let the reaction run for time A, which of those enzyme concentrations do you think might be best to use? Okay, any idea? So I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands again based on which number do you think, which of the four enzyme concentrations would be best if what I wanna do is to measure the product at time A? How many think it, at uh, concentration number one? Anybody? All right, what about concentration number two? Ready? What about number three? And number four, okay. So I saw a lot, I, I saw quite a number for two and three. Um, let's look at that. Um, number one, our challenge here is that we're, we, we have such a little amount of product generated here that it's gonna be very difficult to, to do that. Number two is actually our answer because you can see that the, the tangent line is identical to the, uh, the measured value. Number three, you can see at time A, we're starting to get off there, right? The, the actual number I'm going to have is here. And what I'm going to call it is that is the number on the straight line. And number four, it's, it's just way off. So we've got to try to use the right an, an enzyme concentration where we're in the linear portion of the curve there. OK, let's go on to temperature. Um, enzymes have both, they have optimum temperatures for activity, but there's also an issue of, of temperature related to stability of the enzyme, right? Line number one is enzyme activity, right? Different, you know, different enzymes have different optimum temperatures. Um, the enzymes that work in your body are work well at 37 degrees centigrade. Some enzymes work better at 45 degrees centigrade, right? Some are heat stable up to much higher temperatures. This one shows uh, line number one 
would be um, the activity of the, of the enzyme. Number three, line number three, though, is really getting at this point about the stability of the enzyme, because what are enzymes are proteins, right? And proteins, what happens when we heat them? They denature. They denature, exactly. And so we're going to kill that enzyme if we have too high of a temperature. And that's what line number three is meant to show, that we have with stable here, but then it's going to become destabilized because of denaturation. So you can see line number two is actually about, is, is showing really what's optimal there. And so we would want this, this particular reaction that looks like about right in here would be a good choice for that. Okay, let's go on to pH. We have the same issues here for um, pH, stability and optimum activity. Again, different, um, different enzymes work better under different conditions. Um, do you remember what's the, the major enzyme in your stomach? Do you remember anybody? Pepsin. Pepsin, exactly. Pepsin. And uh, it's optimum pH. What would you guess that is? About? Two, five, two. three. Yeah, two. really low, right? Like two, two to three, two. Uh, versus trypsin, which is the enzyme that gets dumped into your, um, into the upper part of your intestines is like a seven to eight for optimum activity. So different, uh, they have different act, uh, optimum activities. So why is that? Well, um, at optimum pH, that's necessary for the ionization to occur, to get the enzyme substrate um, binding to occur and then to go on and uh, form the product that's generated. But we have a, an example that's given here with regard to trypsin. Remember I said, uh, just like in temperature where we have an issue of, of both a stability and activity, we have the same thing here for pH. We've got to think about stability and activity. Trypsin is, um, is very stable at about pH 3. It is not stable at pH 7 to 8. It will chew itself up. I'll tell you, when I was a, um, when I was a PhD student there uh, doing my degree in food science, but in the biochemistry department, I was up in Gortner lab and I used trypsin a lot. I would always have to make up the trypsin in a hydrochloric acid solution, hold it there until I was ready to use it, and then I would add it to a sample that was buffered at pH seven to eight so that this trypsin could act on the substrate. If I adjusted it uh, up to a high pH, it will just chew itself up because that's, that's what it is. It's an enzyme. Okay. Um, all right. Now we've, so we've talked about things like temperature and pH. Um, now what we need to do is think about activators and inhibitors. Right. First of all, activators. Activators are the kinds of things that you need to add to the reaction to optimize it. So there's two categories you can see here, a prosthetic group uh, that's irreversibly associated with the enzyme um, and a coenzyme. Um, an example of a coenzyme is like um, chloride ions added in, a, in, a, uh, in an amylase assay. Actually, when I did trypsin assays, also I had to make it up, at, it was, had to be about 20 millimolar chloride ions for optimal activity as, as, a, as type of a coenzyme, okay? So these are things that we use um, to make sure we have optimal activity of the, uh, certain enzymes will require these activators, not all. What about the inhibitors? Well, there's, two major categories. You can see an irreversible inhibitors and reversible inhibitors. Um, the details of all these different types of reversible inhibitors are covered in the textbook. I'm not going to go and I'm not going to try to explain all of those now. Um, if Pam wants you to know a lot about those, she'll have to tell you on those. But the point is that they inhibit the enzyme activity, right? Um, so let me ask you this. Imagine that I wanted to do an assay on some roasted soybean flour, all right? Soybeans naturally contain trypsin inhibitor. Um, and, um, 
And that trypsin inhibitor can shut down the trypsin in your digestive system. Actually, if you feed raw soybeans to rats, they will die. Um, okay, so the typical processing, they will take the soybeans, roast the soybeans, so it heats them, right, to inactivate the inhibitor, and then grind that soybean into flour. Now I've got some soybean flour, and I want to test to see if there's any trypsin inhibitor left in that soybean flour, right? So I'm going to read, I, I, I would do my assay with some trypsin and the substrate for trypsin. That happens to be a compound called BAPNA. It's um, um, benzoyl arginine perinitroanalyte. It, it cleaves, you know, trypsin cleaves at an arginine residue and it cleaves and it makes a yellow color that we can measure spectrophotometrically, right? So that's my basic reaction. If I add to it some soybean flour that has a little trypsin inhibitor in it, what's it gonna do to the amount of product? Is it going to increase the amount of product or is it gonna decrease the amount of product? Which way? If there's any trypsin inhibitor present in that assay, is the activity going to increase or decrease? Do we have any answers, Pam, so in the chat box? A lot of people are texting decrease. Decrease, exactly, exactly, because it's an inhibitor. Uh, so usually we want to try to avoid anything inhibiting in an enzyme assay, but we can also use enzyme assays to measure the amount of an inhibitor that's present in a sample, okay? Now, how do we measure those assays? Well, I mentioned in the case of, uh, of a trypsin assay, you measure absorbance. Um, I've forgotten the wavelength that we use, but we can use absorbance spectroscopy. It's the most common method used for enzyme assays. UV or visible, either one, very commonly used, right? Because if the product has a color or it will absorb at some uh, wavelength in the UV visible region, we can quantitate that. We might also use a fluorescence spectrophotometer. Um, a manometric method means we measure a change in pressure. Not, not so commonly used, nor are the other two listed here, titration or isotope measurement. But let's talk a minute about this last one, viscosity, because that one is used um, a, a reasonable amount to measure amylase activity, okay? It's called the falling number test. You'll find it toward the end of your chapter. And remember we talked about if flour, uh, one of the typical quality control tests for flour, wheat flour will be this test for amylase activity. So if I take a sample of the wheat flour, add water, heat it, I will get a, a starch paste, right? Okay. Um, and if there's amylase in that, that uh, starch paste, what's going to happen to it? It's not going to be as thick, is it, right? And what they use is a plunger that they drop through that, star that starch paste. Uh, based on viscosity, that plunger will fall more quickly if it's less viscous, right? So that's one of the few cases that I know of, at least where they use viscosity as a measurement of, um, of color. I mean, of, of enzyme activity. Pam, I can see there's 10 minutes left, so I'll need to keep, I'll keep moving here. Um, so the coupled reaction, it's another principle that we need to make sure that we understand when we talk about doing enzyme assays um, related to food analysis. That means there's two reactions, a measuring reaction and an indicator reaction, two different enzymes, right? Um, so let's say we've got a food constituent here I want to measure maybe compound A is what I want to measure. So I react it with another a compound and there's a first enzyme. I generate some products. One of those products goes on and becomes the reactant in the second reaction. Um, I may add a, I add a second reactant and another enzyme and I generate some products. What I can quantitate then is one of these final products R or S, or I could actually also measure a decrease in the amount of compound C 
um, as a result of this chemical reaction. Now, um, or enzymatic reaction. This is to represent a spectrophotometer at the bottom there. Now, there's a couple cautions with regard to these kinds of assays, coupled reactions. They're very common in food analysis, and that's why we need to pay attention to them. The optimum pH, you can, as you can imagine, we need an optimum, we need a similar optimum pH for those two enzymes. This is not going to work if one enzyme requires pH 3 and the other one requires pH 7, right? So they need to be very similar in pH optimum. And the second point is that the enzyme um, number two, uh, this, this reaction must not be rate limiting. This indicating reaction needs to go faster than the measuring reaction. Why is that? We don't want a lot of product number one sitting there waiting to be reacted in the second re reaction. We want everything to go on through quickly. All right, let's look at a couple of examples of, uh, of coupled reactions. This one you already know about. You studied this in the carbohydrate analysis chapter. Here's our glucose reacting with oxygen and the enzyme glucose oxidase, right? We generate hydrogen peroxide. That's one of our products in that first reaction. It becomes a reactant in the second reaction. We have another enzyme. And we, in this case, we um, measure the amount of oxidized dye. We get a color change as a result of, of this reaction, okay? So that's one very, very commonly used um, coupled reaction in food analysis. Another one is the test for measuring ethanol. Um, the students in my, my lab used to do a, a test kit assay. We could get free test kits from this company in Indianapolis. They were mostly expired test kits, I think, but they gave them to us and we could use them in lab to measure the ethanol content of honey. You know, who knew that honey contains small amounts of ethanol? So they would take the honey, clean it up with the Kares reagent. Do you remember talking about the Kares reagent back in carbohydrate analysis? It'll get rid of the color, get rid of any cloudiness. And now we have a sample that we can test to see if there's any ethanol in that honey. You see, here's our first, re um, first two reactants then. Our first enzyme is alcohol dehydrogenase. Al, um, acetaldehyde becomes a reactant for the, the second reaction. We have our second enzyme. And in this particular case, what we do is measure NADH. Though there's one mole of NADH produced um, for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there's two moles of NADH produced for each one mole of ethanol. You take that into account in the calculations. It's a, we use an absorbent spectrophotometer, I think at 340 nanometers, and it's an easy assay to do. When you buy the test kit with this, it comes with like eight pages of instructions of how to do this assay, all the possibilities. And again, they've got everything for you. They've got the substrate. They tell you what temperature, they tell you what time to use, the enzyme concentration, everything's figured out. Again, because you have to control the kinetics, right? Now, uh, just a reminder again, what we talked about, if what we want to do is measure substrates, like these substrates down here, remember sulfite is, some people are sensitive to sulfite, and so it may be a concern. There's cautions on things if they, if they used sulfites um, to sanitize, to um, sterilize a bottle. Um, glucose and starch, you already talked about. Malic acid, D malic acid is not naturally present in food products. Um, there, some time ago, there was a case where they were selling apple juice for babies and it contained D malic acid. You could detect that here. Real apples contain L malic acid, right? So they were selling fake apple juice. And it's possible to detect that with an, with an enzyme assay, measuring substrates, and remember, in this case, we want the substrate concentration. It's got to be less than the Km value, right? As compared to if what we want to do is measure enzymes, any of these enzymes that are listed here, we need the substrate concentration to be much greater than the Km value. All right. Last couple points here. 
biosensors. We can use enzymes sometimes with biosensors. One of the common ways to measure glucose is actually with the glucose electrode that has glucose oxidase, the enzyme, combined with an oxygen electrode. So as the reaction occurs and oxygen gets used up in that reaction, you can measure the amount of then of glucose. There's another one for quantitating pesticides. Um, this particular type of pesticides will inhibit urease and you can use a biosensor that will be able to detect that inhibition of the enzyme by, the, um, by this particular type of um, a pesticide. So our last slide just comes back and reminds us there's lots of applications of enzymes in food analysis and in food processing. Remember what we said, alkaline phosphatase, right? Adequacy of pasteurization. Rennet, of course, for making cheese. We've got to make sure we have enough rennet to make a big vat full of, of cheese. Um, amylase, alpha amylase, we've talked about that several times. The pectinethylesterase was linked to that orange juice and peroxidase as an indicator of adequacy of, um, of blanching. So um, Pam, I think I, we're, we're done with that, but I wanna see if there's any uh, th uh, points that you want to make um, based on the kinds of questions you're gonna ask them on exams. I think you covered everything uh, that would potentially be asked on the exam. So no, I think everything is clear, at least to me. I enjoyed it. Um, so hopefully the students, if, if there's any question, you guys can type in in the chat. Um, otherwise, yeah. good. So, so I wish you all the best. I, I know it's, it's a challenging semester for you, uh, just as it has been for my students here. I just finished um, the last of the classes I'm doing this semester, and I know what a challenge it has been for all of you, I, I presume you're all home or somewhere, somewhere more permanent now than maybe what you were before. Um, but um, good luck as you um, finish up the semester. And uh, we'll all hope that next semester comes a little easier for us, but probably not anytime soon, huh? Well, yeah. maybe hopefully next year. <laughs> yeah, next year, next year sometime. So, well, it's been my pleasure. I really, I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to get to, to talk with you and um, um, good luck as you finish up uh, the, the, your food analysis class. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank okay. you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy, it's...